Okay, thanks, Ron, and thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm really honored by the Tamist uh, leadership for having me get a chance to come and talk to you about our work uh, today at this meeting. What I want to do is really sort of go back about 15 years or so and, and, and talk about the origins of this, this new idea uh, for how to treat cancer, um, and then go, you know, sort of bring it up to state of the art today, and then spend the last 10 or 15 minutes of the talk talking about you know, where I think the field's going. These are really exciting times uh, in, in immunology and immunotherapy. So first, I just want to thank, uh, as many people have been involved in this, particularly Max Crummel, who was the one that showed that CKLA-4 was, was a negative regulator of T cell responses. Dana Leach, who was the first to do the tumor experiments that have led to a lot of activity, clinical activity and basic science. Sergio, who worked out mechanisms. And then I'll show, be showing a little bit of work from Mike Curran, Zhao Zhoufan, Dimitri Zamarin today. Long-term collaborators, Alan Corman, who worked for Metarex and made the first all-human um, antibody to human CTLA-4. And then clinical collaborators, Jed and, and Pam Sharma, who's the co-director of the platform. And also Metarex, Bristol Myers Squibb, who led the clinical development. All the docs who were involved in that, and mostly the patients who agreed, particularly the ones in the phase one studies, who agreed to have themselves exposed to something that's potentially uh, very dangerous. So why would you want to do immunotherapy? Well, I would submit to you it's because of three things that the immune system offers that other therapies, other therapeutic modalities lack. One of them is specificity. T cells recognize peptides that are made from, derived from virtually everything that's going on in a cell. So if a cell has a virus in it, those viral peptides will be on the surface presented by MHC molecules. The T cells come by, recognize those, get activated and differentiated and go and kill the cells. So we're knowing now, and I'll just touch on this at the end of the talk, we know now that many of the targets uh, that are preferred in patients, certainly those that are treated with NSCLA4, are actually products of mutations in the cell. And so since cancer is a disease of mutations, the T cells are attacking the very process of carcinogenesis itself. And once you've got T cells, they're there for the rest of your life. So you've got memory. The drug goes away, but the effects of it linger for the rest of your life and can be reawakened to, to uh, attack the tumor cells. And finally, there's adaptability. As was mentioned uh, this, um, in, in Margaret's talk, the, the uh, targeted agents that target the oncogenes that drive cancer yield amazing responses, but they're of relatively short duration because the, immune, the, the tumors are heterogeneous at the start. Um, Bert Vogelstein's group has shown by the time a tumor becomes detectable, it has multiple oncogenes in it, and you, you, you know, which makes it very difficult to treat. And there are about nine resistance mechanisms that have been shown just for BRAF inhibitors and melanoma alone. And so it's a daunting task because of the variability in the heterogeneity of tumors. The T cell antigen receptor, the system that generates that, which is another process of somatic mutation, but it's regulated very tightly, but it can generate as many as 10 to the 15th power different T cell antigen receptors. So T cells have the potential, I mean the system, of recognizing 10 to the 15th different thing. That's a huge number, more cells than anybody has. But everybody has about 10 to the 7th to 10 to the 8th different T cell uh, receptors in their own body that can recognize different things. And so I would argue to you that the, that the, the extensive repertoire of the T cell can be a match for the, for the heterogeneity and the adaptability of the tumor, and the immune system can adapt to the tumor as the tumor changes. So, so this has been thought of for many, many years, but for a lot of reasons, it, it really hasn't been all that popular, except for an early surge of interest uh, in the 50s. But by the 70s or so, when people began to identify tumor antigens in human cancers, and began to show that there actually were T cells in human tumors that could recognize those antigens. Um, you know, they, they still, the, the tumors won, and people then started uh, doing active immunotherapy by taking the, the antigens. They, the, the technology wasn't around to really find the mutant antigens at the time. They were mostly shared antigens. But anyway, they tried to develop therapeutic vaccines and tried to vaccinate people with cancer. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of trials that were done over the next two decades, and uh, very disappointing. There were some anecdotal responses here and there, but on the whole, it was just a, it was really, um, not very successful, and so not only the skeptics, but many people who were initially enthusiastic about the idea um, just lost interest in it. And when we started this work, a lot of people said that we were just crazy because the immune system really could never do anything about cancer. And so 
there are a lot of reasons why that might have been the case. You know, choice, choice of the wrong antigen, failure to really adequately activate the immune system or whatever. But I'll submit to you that one thing that might have that might have caused these to fail is that we didn't appreciate the complexity of T cell activation. At the time it was thought that you, early on it was thought that you, all you need is an antigen, self versus non-self recognition. The T cell sees the foreign thing and it takes off, eliminates the problem, and then it stopped, the, the response is stopped by cell death. We showed that, that was a lot more complex. And so this slide really shows this. Um, you can see, you know, showed schematically on the left when a T cell so antigen receptor engages a peptide MAC complex on a cell, it gives a signal, but that's not sufficient for activation. It was known by the late 80s that there was a co-stimulatory signal needed and that only very specialized cells, such as, as uh, dendritic cells, could provide that second co-stimulatory signal. And by the early 90s, we had shown that the, that the molecule CD28 on the T cell surface was sufficient and necessary to provide that second signal to activate naive T cells. And others showed that the ligands for CD28 were mole two molecules, B71 and B72. And so when you got both those signals, all this good stuff happens to the cell cycle machinery. The cell takes off and it makes anti-apoptotic factors so it can proliferate, differentiate, and go out and, and kill whatever the problem is that was, the T cell was alerted to. Um, but we found, and also another group found there, there was a gene bank after we cloned mouse CD28 in a gene bank, there was another molecule called CTLA-4, and nobody knew what it did at the time, and many people thought it was another co-stimulatory molecule, but we studied it as long, well, along with Jeff Bluestone independently at the University of Chicago, and both of us came to the conclusion that it was not a co-stimulatory molecule, but rather it was an inhibitory molecule and that, uh, that, uh, Jeff, that, that uh, Peter Lindsley had proposed it was a co stimulatory molecule, been misled by his in vitro culture techniques. When he added an antibody, he thought it was providing a positive signal. Both Jeff's lab and mine, by different ways that I won't go into, showed that it was actually removing a negative, and that was why it read out as a co stimulatory molecule. Uh, and it, it was also known very quickly that CTLA-4 binds to exactly the same ligands as CD28, but binds them at least a couple of hundredfold tighter. And so, um, you know, this was a down-regulatory molecule, but, you know, how does it work if it's 200 times or more stronger than the, on than the, than the sig uh, co-stimulatory signal? Well, the T-cells solve that conundrum two ways. One is it separates the molecules in time. There is no CTLA-4 in a resting T-cell. The T-cell, the expression of the CTLA-4 gene is induced by T-cell receptor signaling, and it accumulates with time until then it can begin to outcompete because of that higher avidity, uh, outcompete CD28 for the CTLA-4 molecule. So another way of looking at it is there's a program that starts. When you activate a T cell, all these positive programs start about cell cycle, progression, um, eventually the kind of cytokines that are made or acquisition of, of kill molecules that can kill cells, but also the program that's gonna inevitably stop the process is activated because the CTLA-4 gene is turned on and it's gonna stop it after a certain amount of, amount of time. That's just inherent in the process. And so, uh, or else the immune response would keep going and, and kill you. And in fact, that's what it does. After we proposed this, several years after we proposed this, TACVAC and, uh, and Canada and a few other groups showed that it knockout mice, if you genetically delete the CTLA-4 gene, in about three weeks, the immune system kills the mouse. So it's a fatal, phenotype to not have CTLA-4 there. But anyway, just it's sort of, it's a really fun molecule to study because it's got a lot of intricacies. But um, the, the second way that the T cells solve the conundrum of inhibition is by uh, separating these in space also. So that's CD28, a GFP fusion protein, and the, the cell up the upper right is the T cell. When it hits an antigen presenting cell, the co-stimulatory molecule CD28 is drawn into the synapse where it begins to provide that second signal. CTLA-4, on the other hand, is a middle vesicle at the back of the cell. And only after co-stimulation starts, then do you make CTLA-4, it's put in these vesicles at a certain point, then those vesicles, as you can see here in a second, are drugged through the cytoplasm, become behind the immunological synapse, and they're literally sprayed in there. And uh, if you look at this at high resolution, you can see the CD28 is then excluded from it. So that, that's how the process works. So what does this have to do with, with cancer? Well, solid cancer cells don't express co-stimulatory molecules, so they're invisible to the immune system until they accumulate to a point and start dying. That starts a process called 
uh, cross priming, where antigen presenting cells come in and uh, uh, phagocytose the dying tumor bits under inflammatory conditions, then represent the antigen in the context of co-stimulation. That also starts the off process, and the tumor, we believe, has had a chance to get going because of this fact that it does not alert the immune system to its presence until it starts dying, and by then the tumor might have gotten too big. It also, uh, it's possible that in the therapeutic vaccinations, the, on, the off signal was already on, and what happened every time you vaccinated after that is you gave more of the off signal by getting more CTLA-4 expression. So I had the idea that if you just take the brakes off, if you will, by injecting antibodies to CTLA-4, you could just remove that whole pathway and just let the full extent of T-cell proliferation unrestrained by the inhibition uh, to go, and maybe the cells would keep going and kill cancer. And I, I felt this was really a compelling thing to do because, one, you're not treating the cancer cells, so it doesn't matter if the cancer cells caused by a RAS mutation or a KIT mutation or... EGF receptor mutation or anything like that, it doesn't, it doesn't matter because it's a cancer cell. It's going to have mutations that can be seen by the immune system. So we're treating the immune system, not the cancer. We're treating the patient, not the cancer. So this could conceivably work with any kind of cancer because um, we're ignoring the cancer cell. Uh, the other thing is since it, this cross priming is caused by, by cell death, you can combine it with anything that, that kills, with vaccines or anything that kills tumor cells and gets tumor antigens on the surface of antigen presenting cells in the context of the co-stimulatory signals. So this is the first experiment we did. This is a transplantable colorectal carcinoma. And you can see after a while the black line, untreated mice have to be euthanized. If you give them anti-CD28 antibodies, the tumor grows faster because you need co-stimulation to get an immune response started. But if you inject antibodies to CTLA-4, tumor grows for a little while, which, by the way, violates the rules of rhesus. The usual way of evaluating anti-transfer drugs is the shrinkage of the tumor. That doesn't usually happen with this pathway because you're not treating the cancer cell. You're treating the immune system. So the tumor cells can actually enlarge for a while, and it's not because they're growing. It's because they're filling up with T cells, uh, and, and their mass is increasing. But anyway, after that initial progression, they regress. And these experiments, um, it's, uh, um, essentially all the time in these mice. And the mice are permanently immune to rechallenge with that tumor. And so just by covering up this one molecule out of everything that's going on in a tumor cell, we can turn, you know, euthanasia of the mice into permanent immunity. It doesn't always work. B16 tumor, one that Josh Fiddler um, uh, brought to us to the field about 30 years ago, uh, that's a very poorly immunogenic tumor. And nothing, nobody had really been able to do anything about it at all until uh, um, Glenn Dranoff and Dana-Farber made an uh, engineered tumor cell vaccine by putting the, the gene for a molecule called GMCSF into the tumor cells and irradiating them. And he showed that you could, there, you could prophylactically vaccinate against a subsequent challenge with this tumor, but if you do, do it and the tumor's already on board, as shown here, that vaccine does nothing. But and also at acetyl A4, does nothing. But what GMCSF does is it serves as a chemoattractant for dendritic cells and upregulates, which is the antigen presenting cells, and upregulates the B7 molecules on their surface. And so we reason that, well, if you put these two things together, it ought to work really well. And it does. In this experiment, zero plus zero goes to 100% tumor rejection and, and immunity. Usually it's about 85% in experiments, but it's never much less than 85%. Um, so you could make uh, ineffectual therapeutic attempts uh, very effective this way. And the mechanism, I'm just going to show you very quickly and then get on to the clinical studies, is shown here. This is done by Sergio Quesada in the lab. This is an untreated B16 tumor. The vascular tumor is in red. The T cells are in, in green. And uh, there's the, the ICAM staining is in blue. So there's no ICAM on the, uh, on the vascular tumor of the tumor. If you look at the kinds of, I'll come back to that in a minute. If you come to the, back to the, if you look at the kind of T cells, most of them are CD4 T cells that have purple nuclei. That purple is a transcription factor called FOXP3 that directs those cells to make TGF beta and IL-10, which inhibit the activity of other T cells. It actually even keeps them from coming into the tumor. And Tyler Curiel, who's in the audience, has worked with these cells over the years. And there's not very many CD8 T cells, killer cells, in the tumor. But after we vaccinate and give anti 4 you can see now the vascular tumor is blue, 
It's began to upregulate ICAM and VCAM. That tells the T cells that are going through the vasculature to stop, bind to it, stop rolling, and then just slow down and then actually extravasate into the tumor. And so you can see there's a lot more green out there on the left-hand panel. And there's still a few of those uh, FOXP3 positive cells there, but they're a little, the, their proportion in the, in the population is very much smaller. And for the first time, there are a lot more FOXP3 negative CD4 cells that are making both TGF beta and gamma interferon, both of which will kill tumors. So there's a lot more CD8 cells that, have, that carry granzyme and other molecules that they can act directly kill tumors. So we've seen this in virtually every animal model that we've looked at and also every human cancer that we've looked at. Um, the net effect here is really the, the, the signature of this is an increase in the ratio of, of effector that's FOXP3 negative here to FOXP3 positive cells after therapy, and the same for CD8 cells. The ratio of effector cells uh, to, to uh, these uh, suppressor cells uh, is increased greatly. And the cytokines, if you just look at the cytokines there, there's very little detectable TGF beta IL-10 after treatment, it's been replaced by, TG, by TNF alpha and, and gamma interferon. So we worked with, we teamed up with Alan Corman and, and Metarex, and they made a fully human antibody to C24. They had mice, which had had the mouse immunoglobulin genes replaced by human. And so they made this um, antibody, it was originally called MDX010, and uh, for reasons that no one understands, the FDA named this ipilimumab. The Mumab, it makes sense because that means it's a mouse monoclonal antibody. The Ipili, nobody can understand, but anyway, Ipili Mumab was what it's called. I was at Berkeley at the time, and we tried to convince them to put an H in front of it in honor of its origin in Berkeley, but I guess they thought that Ipili Lumumab was not a good name for a cancer drug. But anyway, so there have been over 50,000 patients treated with Ipili Lumumab to date. There have been objective responses, as Ron mentioned, in many, many types of cancer in in these early trials, including melanoma, prostate, bladder, ovarian, lung, kidney, glioblastoma, a few complete responses in, in uh, pancreatic cancer. All anecdotal, as soon as Bristol Myers Squibb teamed up with uh, uh, Metarex, they decided to go for registration and chose to do that in, in melanoma. So a lot of those other trials started, stopped for a while until recently. There are adverse events. These weren't seen in mice. They weren't seen in monkey tox studies. But in patients, they were seeing they're largely colitis, hepatitis, apophysitis, a lot of itises. But these are all uh, inflammatory uh, responses. They're not really autoimmunity because the patients are treated with systemic steroids, and the, the uh, adverse events go away, and they don't come back when you taper off the, uh, the steroids to the patients. So I'd like to show this slide. This is one of my favorites. This is a woman I actually met. Her name is Sharon. She's in Santa Monica, played California, played a lot of tennis, and consequently developed metastatic melanoma. Um, she had failed everything else, and her doctor, Tony Rebus, you know, asked her to, to uh, you know, risk taking this, this new drug first in man. I mean, not, she wasn't the first. She was in the phase one trial, though. And remember, there was a lot of fear. We didn't see toxicity in mice, but remember the phenotype of the knockout mice is lethal. Uh, they just die. But anyway, she got a he told her, you know, well, will you take this? She said, I, I just want to live long enough to see my sons graduate from high school. So the figure here shows this, this metastasis in her lung. It was about the size of a grapefruit. And then this pleural effusion down here, she'd, again, she had failed everything. That was the way she was in May 2001. She got a single dose of, of three mg per kg um, of uh, ipilimumab. And this is a CAT scan over 10 years later. So she was free of tumor within about six months, and this is 10 years later. And she's now uh, out, you know, almost four years more than that now. So that's almost 15 years after a single treatment. And I had the, the pleasure of meeting her when I was at UCLA just after she'd had this, this CAT scan. Um, this works not only um, in, 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 uh, sub, you know, in subcutaneous or lung metastases, it also works in brain metastases. You can see here there's the tumor that went completely away and other patient. And this is a, I'm not gonna go through any of this because I could do that for a right period of the top talk. But anyway, you can see this patient has this, this big prostate cancer here. His bladder's very compressed. After therapy, this was with a vaccine as well, but you can see that the bladder's now is not compressed anymore and the tumor's basically gone. Um, PSA went to normal and, and bone scans and everything cleared up. So this is an 800 patient randomized 
placebo-controlled trial in stage three and four melanoma that, that was uh, done. It was initiated about 1995 or so. Sorry, about 2005. Um, it was initially planned to be the endpoint was program progression-free survival, but you know our mouse studies have said that's not a very good way to measure this because you'll you'll a lot of people might respond slowly. And the clinicians on this were astute and paying attention. They noticed that many of their patients they were treating in early trials would respond only after four or five or six months even. Um, but a lot of patients had slow uh, responses. And so they changed the endpoint to overall survival in the middle of the trial. And so the trial took five years to do. And so the median survival, which is the usual standard by which you evaluate drugs, moved over about four months. So this was pretty good because no other drug had ever shown any increase in survival in melanoma, metastatic melanoma, in a randomized trial such as this. So that would have been sufficient for approval. But the really cool thing, and just ignore this middle line, that's what a vaccine was used there, which might have actually done some damage, but because it was not a good vaccine, it was not the right vaccine. But anyway, uh, what you can see is that about two years to two and a half years, the survival curve flattens out at about 22 or 23 percent and stays there for the duration of this, this trial. And uh, the placebo-controlled arm just basically goes away after that. So this was approved by the FDA in 2011 for the treatment of metastatic melanoma. Steve Hody at uh, Dana-Farber recently did reported a 5,000 patient uh, follow-up retrospective analysis. And this is the results of that showing, again, this inflection point in about three years, and you can see the tail of the curve gets flat and stays there for 10 years. This is a 10-year follow-up. So the patients that made it two and a half to three years are good for 10, at least, and that's when you know, they're still being observed. But, um, so this was a pretty, pretty exciting event. Um, but of course, now c 4 was the first um, immune, in cell intrinsic immune checkpoint um, discovered. But there are many more we know now, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about PD-1. This was discovered by Tosco Hanjo in 1992, but nobody really knew what it did until 2001 when Gordon Freeman and Arlene Sharp at Dana-Farber showed that they identified its ligands and, and repeated the experiments that we had done and showed that it was an immune checkpoint. This immediately went into mouse preclinical studies in cancer. They, were, they looked a lot like what we'd gotten. Immediately went into clinical trials. Um, and uh, PD-1 is interesting. This, this was the, the phylogenetic tree, by the way. Um, so it's interesting because it has two ligands, just like NSCTLA-4, it has two CTLA-4, it has two ligands on antigen-presenting cells, but unlike CTLA-4, one of the ligands, pd one can be induced, can be expressed on tumor cells. It's induced by gamma interferon. So if you have T cells in there, they will cause the tumor cells to put up this molecule that will then protect them from T cell-initiated uh, killing. Um, so there were antibodies developed to, to, to uh, block that interaction. There are about six antibodies to PD-1 in clinical development and a couple to pd one the ligand, and, um, to, to each of the ligands, actually. And so it, it also had activity in many kinds of cancer, including uh, kidney, uh, um, lung shown here, non-small cell lung cancer, um, and colon cancer, at least colon cancer that has high levels of microsatellite instability but for some reason doesn't work in prostate cancer. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of excitement about it. This just shows the range of tumors that are, responsible, that, are, that are responsive to it. So it's somewhere around melanoma, which I'll talk about the rest, is about close to 30% responses. And this shows, this is a spider plot. Each of those lines is a different patient showing the tumors. Um, there are a few patients here that, that, show, that show new tumors at other sites. But anyway, uh, you can see a lot of the patients, the tumors rapidly shrink and, and have fairly durable survival. Uh, we're not, not sure how uh, far out that goes. That was reported in 2012. Um, that antibody has recently been approved by the, by the FDA also, in fact, about a month ago for the treatment of metastatic melanoma. And Merck has a similar antibody that's been approved for treating metastatic melanoma. But we reasoned that since these things work evenly, work differently, that their uh, mechanisms are completely different. What I forgot to mention, is that PD-1 works by recruiting a phosphatase to the immunological synapse and interferes with T cell antigen receptor signal transduction, completely different mechanism than CTLA-4. So we reason that if you put them together, it might work better. And so uh, this just shows that's a 
true. In fact, Mike Curran, who's now an assistant professor at MD Anderson, if you start blocking these things in combination, you, you move the survival curve up higher. So there was a combination trial then of NSCTLA-4 um, plus NAPD-1. And so the reasoning here was one of, maybe the reason that some of the patients that did not respond to CTLA-4 blockade were not responding because PD-1 was there, could provide a different mechanism of inhibition. And sure enough, if you put the two antibodies together, two-thirds of the patients showed some level of tumor shrinkage. Fifty percent of the patients had reached 50 percent shrinkage, which is uh, considered objective um, uh, response. And the bottom, this is a waterfall plot. These are, again, individual patients looked at a, specific, a specified amount of time after the therapy. And you can see down here about 50% of the patients had objective responses again. But of those who responded, almost 50% had 80% or more tumor shrinkage. And so this is really, really, um, by just the classic, these are the classical criteria, criteria looking at tumor shrinkage. Um, but something I didn't mention that's a critical uh, observation was that CTLA-4, the objective response rate is 9%, even though 22% of people are alive 10 years after therapy. So obviously that objective response rate is not a very useful criteria in these sorts of drugs because it grossly underestimates the, uh, the survival, more so for NSCTLA-4 than NFPD-1, again, which has a different mechanism. So this is just a truly astounding thing. Now this is a busy curve because this shows a bunch of dose combinations, but the combination, this red line, the combination of one mg per kg of NIPD-1 plus three mg per kg of NICTLA-4, the two-year survival of those patients, again, it is a, the objective response rate was 50%, but the two-year survival is 88%, and that's all comers. There's no funny business with calculating this. That's just following those patients in the phase one. So if those patients make it three years, um, if the mechanism works the way you think they are, they're good to go for 10 years. And so that's, uh, you know, we don't know yet. I should point out that this is not a randomized trial. It's just following a phase one. It's a fairly small number of patients. But, you know, this kind of study is about as good as you can get in treating metastatic melanoma. So here's where we are in the field. You know, determine what we need to do to get this to move along now is really understand the cellular molecular mechanism. And we know a, a lot about c 4 from mouse and human studies, but... We still don't know exactly you know, what, what's the, the true killer effect. And we know very almost nothing about how PD-1 works. Um, we need to develop predictive prognostic or pharmacodynamic biomarkers. Uh, we need to start thinking about how to combine these agents with the standard of care uh, in a number of different cancers. And then if we can, identify even new molecules to target to improve efficacy. And so just sort of as uh, what we're doing now and to tell you what's going on at MD Anderson, is uh, we've started a, a new way of doing trials. It's basically based on the on early work of, of Pam Sharma, who's a GU oncologist at MD Anderson. So we realized that, the, 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 even I realized this when I was at Sloan Kettering, you really can't do mechanistic studies at all on, on, uh, on the standard phase one, phase two, phase three system of, of looking at drugs, of clinical development of drugs, because all you can get is blood, and even then you're limited. You really can't get tumor tissue except tiny needle biopsies or some core biopsies under some conditions. So you don't have enough tissue to really do much. And so what Pam Sharma pioneered was the use of pre-surgical trials where you take patients that are going to surgery to have an organ removed uh, with localized disease initially, but later on, I don't want to tell you about that later, but anyway, so you treat them with the drug before they go to surgery. The surgery is going to be curative, but you get a lot of material uh, for um, analysis. So this just shows the, the, the schema of the first trial she did. So patients got a couple of doses of NSCTLA-4, then went to surgery. These were patients with localized bladder cancer. She's also done this in, in uh, prostate and in renal cancer. But they go to surgery, and then they're, they're followed up. But what you get in bladder cancer is you get the whole bladder, and you get the bladder cancer cells, save a little biopsy that the, that the pathologist has taken for clinical needs. Um, to study, and you can get enough tissue out of that to do tissue functional analyses of the T cells, expression analysis, sequencing of the, of, of the T cells, and look if there's changes in this, what goes on in the tumor. Um, just all the stuff that you can do, you can do if you've got a lot of tissue here. And as a, as a bonus, certainly not for the patients, but for the, uh, 
for the trial was that about half the men on this trial uh, had prostate cancer as well, and they take out the prostate at the same time. So we got a lot of information from that. So if we looked at the gene expression signature, these are all, so we, what we did was expression arrays starting with normal tissue and with treated tissue and all the things that changed, then you compared the ones that changed. And this ICOS pathway really stuck out as being the biggest fold change in things. All the rest of our T cells as well. But what is ICOS? Well, this, no, sorry, this just shows what happened by flow cytometry. So these, these ICOS is expressed on CD4 cells. There's about 13% of the T cells, CD4 cells in non-malignant tissues express ICOS. It's about the same in tumor. When you give NICTLA-4, that goes way up. And the same thing happens in the blood. So now we know we've got a marker we can look at in the blood that'll reflect what's going on in the patients. And there it's even a bigger change, 3% at baseline. We'll see it goes up five to tenfold even in some patients. So what is ICOS? Well, it was on that chart I showed you earlier. Uh, it's very closely linked, very highly uh, related to CTLA-4 and CD28. It's got its own uh, independent ligand. Uh, it's usually, if you'd ask an immunologist, though, what it is, uh, he would say, well, it's a TH, the follicular T helper cell that's found in the lymph nodes. It helps B cells class switch, makes type 2 cytokines. You don't want those in a tumor because those are or don't lead to, to inflammatory responses or killing, are the Tregs, which would be these cells that make TGF beta and IL-10, which you also don't want. And so both those things are kind of contraindicated. But what uh, Pam did was to sort those cells from these patients and, sh and then test them. Turned out um, three of the patients in her trial expressed the molecule NYU cell one. This is what's called a cancer testes antigen. It's epigenetically regulated. It goes up in about one third of cancer patients. And so we could test for cells that responded to that. What you can see here is the number of those cells, I'm sorry, the, the, the T cells that um, had high levels of ICOS made gamma interferon specifically in response to tumor antigens. It was induced in these two patients. The other patient already had them. So this shows you then that that's where the action is when you give NSCTLA-4. It's in these CD4 cells um, that have ICOS on them. That's where the tumor-specific T cells are. And then we wanted to see if that uh, had anything to do with survival. She couldn't tell that from her trial because the patients were going to be cured by surgery, although three of the 12 patients she treated were completely free of tumor by, by uh, uh, genetic and uh, uh, histochemistry markers when they went to surgery. But anyway, this is melanoma patients. When I, we had a, about a, we had two or 300 samples from patients. We separated them into two different categories, those in which you didn't see a stable increase in the CD4s with the ICOS or those where you did. The survival of the ones that didn't was about eight months. The ones where it did go up was over 20 months. So that told us that you know, this might be a marker of, 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 uh, of just the, the health of the patient's immune system. Or maybe ICOS really plays something, a role in the therapeutic effect of anacetylate 4 we can't tell that from a clinical trial. You can't answer that question. But it generates that hypothesis that it does play a role. So then we went back to our animal models and showed this is the, the efficacy in a wild-type mouse, and anacetylate 4 loses about half its efficacy in, in mice that lack either ICOS or its ligand. So it is important, the efficacy. And so the second hypothesis was you could target ICOS to improve the efficacy. So what we did here was to make a vaccine that expressed uh, ICOS ligand or not, and then irradiate them and repeated Glendranoff sorts of experiments uh, with or without NSCTLA-4. And just to cut to the chase, these are all the monotherapies here. This is NSCTLA-4 plus the vaccine that does not have ICOS ligand, and this is with the ICOS ligand. Uh, so having the ICOS ligand around makes the NSCTLA-4 work about four times better. And if you do that in ICOS knockout mice, it doesn't work. So it's signaling through the ICOS molecule, which engages the AKT pathway that's giving you that effect. So what now? Well, there are a bunch more uh, immune checkpoints that have been discovered. We need to look at those. Uh, there's other immunosuppressive molecules. Um, there are um, convention we've shown that uh, you can use oncolytic viruses or, or cryoablation of local tumors and get a really good response systemically. Uh, we've done a lot of work combining it with, with conventional therapies. Um, and then I'll just close really quickly by talking about combination with genomically targeted therapies as well as personalized vaccines. And I especially want to stress the importance of beginning to combine these immunotherapies 
which, which give, again, durable responses lasting a decade, but in a fraction of patients. Genomically targeted therapies give you a response that lasts a few months uh, in essentially every patient or a large fraction of the patients uh, that express the antigen. And this just shows the power of this. This is a combination of anti-PD-1 with two different TKIs um, um, in metastatic renal cancer. And the one on the left is Sutent. Um, and um, it uh, affects, uh, affects uh, vascularization. But every single, it, the response of either of those agents alone is about 30% in this sort of acid. But you put them together, and 100% of the patients in this trial responded to the combination. So those are durable. We're going to really, uh, this is going to be a really hot combination. But, but I think that um, just to throw out a, a, an attitude here, I think that there's a lot of money being spent, and Margaret mentioned this, to, to try to have curative effects by combining these drugs that target one thing each at a time, and uh, they give you uh, short-term responses. And I think the hope that these will ever be curative in and of themselves is pretty small. There's very little known about the impact of these molecules on the immune system, but we got involved in some studies a couple of years ago uh, of vimurafenib, which is a BRAF, mutant BRAF inhibitor. It, it's terrific at inducing responses in metastatic melanoma, um, but it always recurs. But we did a study of it and showed that if you give in, in vitro a completely reductionist experiment of T cells in a tube with antibodies to T cell receptor, and CD28 and with NSC24 around. If you add vimurafenib to that, you get about three times as many T cells growing out of the cultures. And if you do blots, which we did with Neil Rosen, you see that the MAP kinase pathway is supercharged by that drug that's supposedly attacking mutant uh, BRAF. It just supercharges the, the uh, uh, BRAF, the MAP kinase pathway in T cells, but only after they're stimulated with antigens. So that should be a perfect sort of drug to combine with CTL4. So it's out of time here, but we're developing, this is just mutations in tumors. We're also working on ways of developing personalized vaccines against specific mutant antigens. So this is where we have been in cancer therapy, move, moving the mean over. Uh, we know with CTLA-4, we can get, again, decades-long responses in about 20% of patients. We know by combining it with PD-1, we can lift the tail. And so the goal now is to do this in many different types of cancers we can with combinations, both conventional and immunotherapeutic agents. So I'll stop there. Sorry for going a little over. exciting talk and for discovery that you initiated. I am a physicist, not a um, um, microbiologist, and I just want to ask you, do you think that some simulation by physical methods, like laser mm -hmm. irradiation, can additionally improve the effect of immunotherapy by... Yeah, yeah, I, I do. I mean, we didn't, for time I couldn't mention, but we showed years ago that if you, if you under conditions where you can completely cure a localized tumor in animal models, um, the mice still die because there are already metastases. But if you give anti-CTLA-4 after that, that uh, targeted therapy just of the primary, uh, the mice have systemic immunity and the, the mets go away too and we get a big increase in survival. We've shown the same thing with freezing of one tumor and then followed by anti-CTLA-4 gives a systemic effect um, throughout the mouse. So yes, those are good things to do as well. Maybe a short addition to your question. This might sound ignorant. Uh, usually chemotherapy suppresses, right, I I immune uh, response. Yeah. But you said that you want to use it in combination. Isn't it contradictory? Yeah, so with chemo a lot of chemotherapies are immunosuppressive, but all you have to do is is, look, is pay attention to the scheduling because most, chemothera most chemotherapeutic drugs have half-lives that can be measured in hours. So with these kind of immunotherapies, you've got about a week with which after you kill tumor cells, you've got about a week with those antigen-loaded dendritic cells priming response. So all you have to do is wait two or three days. And we did this, we did this with cisplatinum in, a bunch of, in several mouse models. You give a drug a subcurative dose and then you just wait three or four days and give the anacetyl 4 
and you take advantage of that cell death that you've caused. Now, these other drugs, the targeted therapies, may or may not be suppressive. Obviously, the MAP kinase pathway you wouldn't want to target. But a lot of them spare the tumors. But still, there's, a, there's reason to just look carefully at dose and, and scheduling of it. I think one can do the combination. 